morning. It's found in Luke, the 15th chapter. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, where I'd like to read the first seven verses. Luke 15, we begin at the first verse. Hear now God's word. Now all the publicans and sinners were drawing near unto him to hear him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners, and eateth with them. And he spake unto them this parable, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, and having lost one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that even so there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine righteous persons who need no repentance. And thus far the reading. Of God's Word. Although we are turned to a new gospel this week, we're looking at the Gospel of Luke, whereas last Lord's Day we were in the Gospel of Matthew, it turns out that the setting for the two stories that we have considered is exactly the same. Last week, Jesus called Matthew to be his disciple, and it turns out Matthew, having thrown a party for the publicans and sinners of that society to rejoice in finding the Lord, that occasion brings criticism to Jesus because he's now fellowshipping with publicans and sinners. Here in Luke, the 15th chapter, the setting is exactly the same. The Jewish religious leaders and all of their pride and all of their self-righteousness are criticizing Jesus because he's socializing with and he's dealing with publicans and sinners. And remember how wretched such people were and how poorly esteemed they were in that society. Publicans were traitors. They agreed with the Romans. They facilitated the Roman oppression and rule over the Jews. And they made their money by extorting money from their fellow countrymen. The sinners, polite way of saying, the harlots, the loose women, the prostitutes of society, and all others that were looked down upon because of their violation of the law of God and the Jewish traditions, These are the people Jesus comes to. These are the people to whom he ministers. Indeed, throughout the Gospels, the thing that strikes you if you read them throughout the Gospels is that these Jewish religious snobs are continually set in contrast to Jesus, who with compassion and humility ministers to all kinds of people. That's very encouraging. It's very encouraging to me that Jesus is willing to minister to all kinds of people. I'm glad when I open the Gospels and read about the life of Jesus, I don't read about a man who only had time for those who had the proper education or the proper social credentials or came from all the right families or had just enough money or a nice home. I'm glad I read about a man who cared for men as men and women as women, cared for them because they were created by God and they were in need of his help. Jesus is never ever found in the Gospels refusing help to those who recognize their need of it. Well, this is the Jesus we read of in the 15th chapter of Luke. When all the publicans and sinners were drawing near unto him to hear him, both the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners, and he even eats with them. Isn't that interesting to you, that the publicans and sinners draw near to him? Why do you think that is? Why would publicans and sinners come to the Son of God, the one who could say, which one of you criticizes me and brings any charge of sin against me? Why would they who live in the darkness be so drawn to the one who represents the light of God? Well, it's the compassion and the love of Jesus that does it. For you see, if they would have known you know, the holiness of God and their own sin, you would think they would be repelled. But as a matter of fact, they're drawn to Jesus because in all of his holiness, he shows the mercy and the grace of God. Luke tells us they were all coming to Jesus. He was drawing them in. But now the religious leaders get involved and they say, they murmur, they complain. This man, he touches the unclean. There's something wrong here. 
And Jesus replies now by speaking a parable according to verse 3. He replies to his critics with a parable. What is a parable? You know the child's answer to parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. You've probably heard that before, and that's true enough. I think we might uh, refine it a little bit and say that it's an ordinary incident or an ordinary story with a spiritual application. It's a matter of looking at one thing that happens in life and seeing in that a pattern of spiritual truth that can be applied to us. And this is exactly what Jesus does, and he tells the familiar story of a shepherd that has a hundred sheep. A hundred sheep's not a terribly large flock, but it's a lot larger than you and I would be able to manage, I would imagine, and uh, worth a little bit of money, too. This man has a hundred sheep, and one of them, he goes to take his uh, evening count, and one of them is missing. He has only 99. Can you imagine what the shepherd would do? Well, I have a hard time with this. You give me a jar full of marbles, and I have to count them, and then you count them, we get a different number. I hate that, because it seems like the simplest thing is the thing I can't do. You can give me complicated math problems and quadratic equations and all that, but just counting out the marbles, I don't know, maybe it's because it's so boring, your mind wanders. But can you imagine the shepherd says, now wait a minute, getting all these sheep to lie down and to hold still and not getting confused, this is tough enough, there's only 99. I must have made a mistake. And so he goes back and goes through this process of counting the sheep, looking around, there's still only 99. Jesus says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep and having lost one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? (laughs) I have to chuckle a bit. Jesus puts that as a rhetorical question. He takes it as obvious, the answer. But you see, the answer is not obvious, is it? I don't think it was obvious in his day either. But it certainly isn't obvious to me, and it isn't obvious in terms of the people I know. I think that if I had a hundred sheep, And I counted and recounted that, one, I'd be irritated that that sheep was gone. I'd say, now, I worked all day to keep these sheep together and to protect them, and this sheep doesn't even care enough to do what it's told. And here's this sheep wandering off and inconveniencing me. And I'd probably sit down and I'd take out the ledger and I'd start thinking, now, what's it going to cost me to lose this one sheep? What's it going to cost me? After all, if I get up and I leave and I go looking for the sheep and the wolves come and they attack the 99, I'll lose that investment. Well, forget that disobedient, ignorant sheep wandering out there. You see why it's kind of, to me, humorous that Jesus says, now which one of you wouldn't get up and go and look? And I'm thinking, well, I don't think I would. At least it's questionable. I think I wouldn't say it's obvious that I'd get up and look for that sheep. I don't think you would either. But Jesus is talking about a good shepherd. We're not shepherds. Shepherds spend a lot of time with their sheep, and they um, it's not my kind of life, I admit, but I understand that they get pretty attached to them. They learn to love these sheep. In fact, Jesus tells us in John the 10th chapter about the good shepherd who calls his sheep by name. Can you imagine that? Spending hours and hours out there on the hillsides, grazing your sheep, the shepherd, maybe for want of anything else to do, but the shepherd comes up with names for the sheep. And so when he goes to count, he can actually say, well, this is this sheep, and this is this sheep, and and he actually knows the name of the one that's missing. And the shepherd cares because he knows that that one, a hundred sheep, even huddled together, are not able to protect themselves. And that's an interesting thing about sheep. You, it doesn't make any difference how many you get They will not defend themselves. They are unable to do so. Have you ever looked at a sheep? What's a sheep going to do? I I suppose the best you could do, if if you were a football coach, you might say, well, there's some weight there, run over the person. But they don't have teeth with which they bite. They don't have horns. They don't scratch you. What do sheep do to protect themselves? They're absolutely defenseless. Jesus knows how the shepherd will think here. The shepherd says that one sheep is out there, and a hundred, that's, they're defenseless enough, but one, not a chance of survival. The wolves will find the sheep and tear it apart. They'll come across a bear, and that'll be the end of it. Or the sheep will not be able to find water. (laughs) That's another thing. You have to take sheep to water. The sheep is just going to die. And so that shepherd loves the one lost sheep 
and goes out looking. You see, the shepherd's concern is not a matter of averages. The good shepherd doesn't say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I got 99 out of 100. That's a good day. He says, no, if there's one lost, I'm going. And it's not a matter of convenience. You can be sure at the end of the day, this shepherd wants to lay down, wants to sleep, wants to have his dinner. He wants to take it easy. I mean, you know how that is. You come home 4.35 in the afternoon, you've worked all day. You don't want to have to go out and take care of some problem that's arisen during the day. You want to take your ease. You want to have your convenience. The shepherd doesn't. And the shepherd's concern is not a matter of small effort either because Jesus says in verse 4 that he goes after that which is lost until he finds it. That's another thing that's unlike me. I think if I did the right thing, I might go out for an hour or two. And I'd look here and I'd look there and I'd get skinned up crawling over the rocks and I'd have feet that are wet going through the ponds and the streams and so forth looking for the sheep. And after a while I'd say, forget it. That's enough. But the good shepherd looks and looks and looks and spends all night, if need be, until he finds that sheep. And you can imagine, if I can embellish the story a bit here, the shepherd may be about dawn, finally finding this lost sheep. And not only do we see the shepherd's concern in what Jesus says, we see the shepherd's tender care. You know, I read verse uh, 5 here, and I ask myself the question, where's the scolding? Where's the prodding? Where's the discipline? After all, this sheep has cost the shepherd a great deal. But Jesus says, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Well, I would imagine that if it were left you and me in our own habits, that if we found this sheep, we might kick it a couple times. I'd say, you bad little sheep, what are you doing out here? I had to leave the 99, and they were unprotected all night long because of you. And look at this, I got scratched up, and my feet are cold, and I haven't had my dinner, and I spent all night looking for you. I don't want this ever to happen again, and if it does, we'll just leave you out here to die. Nothing like that. The shepherd finds the sheep. And you know, that's another thing. The shepherd not only doesn't scold, you would think the shepherd would take his shepherd's crook, if he still has it, if he hasn't lost it or left it along the way, and start hitting that little sheep and say, now go that way, over there, back where you belong. You know, prod, 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 until the sheep finally gets back where it belongs. But look at the tender care of the shepherd who has lost all of this and been so inconvenienced, comes and he picks up the sheep and he lays it on his own shoulders to make sure that, one, the sheep is protected and guarded and that it gets back where it belongs. The sheep doesn't even have to walk on its own, the shepherd. And the word that kills you is the last word in the verse. He does it rejoicing. See, I'd be grumbling. I'd be saying, well, I guess this is what I have to do for this sheep, huh? But the shepherd is so happy to find that sheep that he does this rejoicing. And so you see the shepherd's concern in verse 4, and you see the shepherd's tender care in verse 5. And then in verse 6, I think we come to the most amazing thing of all. The tired shepherd is above all rejoicing to find, rejoicing to help that lost sheep. And he's so happy about saving the sheep that now he throws a party to celebrate. This is incredible. You'd think you'd get back and say, okay, we've got to get back to business, Alice. You know, I've lost a lot of time. I need to move on to other pastures. He says, no, I'm going to call in all my neighbors and let them know that I lost one of my sheep, and now I found it. And I'm happy about that. And my guess is the shepherd undoubtedly, in order to feed his neighbors and friends and to put on this party, probably spent more than the sheep was worth. What's the application? Remember, a parable is a mundane story, an earthly story, a regular incident, if you will. But we see here a pattern that has spiritual application. And Jesus says in verse 7, I say to you that even so there shall be joy in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. 
Remember here that Jesus is talking about those who think they need no repentance. The scribes and the Pharisees, those who are religiously superior and they don't need any of this uh, stuff Jesus is talking about, and they're concerned about the publicans and sinners he associates with. He says, God rejoices, not that there are scribes and Pharisees who think they're all right. He doesn't rejoice because of all of their meticulous effort to please God and to earn their own way into heaven by doing all of their traditions and little picky rules. Jesus says, no, God rejoices when that wandering sheep is found. When one person, when one person out of the mass of humanity recognizes his or her sin and repents of it, coming to Jesus Christ for salvation, Jesus tells us that the Lord God in heaven rejoices with all of his angels. In fact, if you read the next account, if we can look at it very briefly in verses 8, 9, and 10, a similar story. He says, What woman having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she hath found it, she calleth together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Even so I say unto you, There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. I was real concerned earlier this week when Bob Pegram called us and said that he thought he had lost or somebody had stolen $500 from him. I thought that was terrible. And then later Bob called us and told us that after diligent search he had found it. And you can imagine, you know, how happy he sounded. And boy, we were happy for him too. He didn't call us over for a party. (laughs) Spend some of that money, you know, to rejoice. But here's this woman who loses much less. You know, she has 10 pieces of silver and she loses 10%. It's not very much. It's worth about one day's labor, I would imagine. And now she puts on a party. And Jesus says, it's like in heaven. When one sinner repents, all the angels are celebrating and God himself rejoices when that which is lost has been found. What is the application that we need to make of this? What's the application you need to make to yourself about this? You say, well, this is this is kind of a strange story. It's about sheep and shepherds and things I don't know about. Well, I want to maintain that if you understand its parabolic character, that it's a parable, you see here a pattern that it's not at all unfamiliar, even if you don't know about sheep and countrysides and all that sort of thing. What we see here is a pattern of wandering away and doing things we shouldn't do, and the very one that should discipline us and perhaps punish us for us is the one who rejoices to find us and to bring us back. What's Jesus talking about? What is the spiritual truth here? Perhaps it would be helpful if we remember Isaiah chapter 53, the sixth verse, where Isaiah the prophet says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. But Jehovah has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Bible says we can be likened to sheep. And that's not flattering. The Bible, when it likens us to sheep, isn't speaking well of us. It's saying in the first place we're defenseless. We're ignorant. We can't take care of ourselves. We can't find our own water to drink. We wander away. You know, sheep tend to do that. You know, They'll start grazing here, and then they see another little tuft of grass that looks good, and then they go over here. And you know, sheep, you watch them. They don't look around. They don't say, okay, now where's the herd? Okay, now another step over here. Where? No, they just start eating and eating and eating and eating and eating, and they just keep wandering. They see something that's interesting, and they wander, and they never check on their bearings. They don't look for the flock. They don't worry about the shepherd, and pretty soon they wander off. And the Bible says that's what we're like. We're like wandering sheep. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've walked out of the way. We've left the fold. We've left our protection. We've left our shepherd. We have left our master, and we've gotten ourselves into a lot of trouble. And you have, haven't you? You've gotten into a lot of trouble in this life. You've gotten into trouble, maybe many times people don't know how much trouble you're in. They don't know how much you're suffering inside, personally and emotionally or psychologically. Maybe you've gotten into trouble socially. Maybe you've had some run-ins with the law. Maybe you've seen family problems. Maybe you haven't held down a job. 
Maybe your sin has taken other forms and brought you into other consequences. But in one way or another, I think every one of us in this room knows what it is to wander. To spiritually not be right with God, to not do what he tells us to do, and to get ourselves into a whole lot of trouble because of it. Now, what do you think God should do about that? Well, you know what you'd think? You would think God might say, tough, let them wander. If they're that stupid, if they don't care enough, then I'm going to let them go. But you know, it breaks my heart when I read the Bible because it says they comes looking for us. He says, I don't care if I have 99 here. I'm not going to let that one go. And so he looks and he traces out all the places we might be. And then he finds us. He looks until he finds. And then you'd expect God to say, okay, now there's going to have to be a lesson here. Now, what are you going to do about this to get back in my favor? What are you going to do to show that you'll be a good little sheep and do what you're supposed to do? But he doesn't. Instead of scolding us, he picks us up and puts us on his shoulders. He says, I'm just so glad to find you. I'm going to take you home. And then above all, God goes back to the angels of heaven. He says, we need to have a party. Because there was one sinner out there who recognized his sin, recognized that he was a wandering sheep, and he's been found now. And all the angels in heaven rejoice when even one of us out of the mass of humanity is willing to confess sin and to throw ourselves for pardon upon the mercy of Jesus Christ, the Savior. There's a whole lot of people in this world. And I think God, if anyone, could be understood if he said, I'm just going to play the law of averages. We get a few in here, that's great. But the Bible says it only takes one out of all that are out there. All who don't think they need him, by the way. All who are self-righteous and just as sinful as the wandering sheep. God goes looking for the one, and when he finds it, he just rejoices. I'm going to ask you this morning if you don't want to make God very happy today. Do you want to make God rejoice? Would you like there to be a party in heaven? Well, there's going to be. If only one of you who recognizes his or her sin says, I need the shepherd to pick me up and to carry me home. That's just really how simple it is. In John, the 10th chapter, Jesus likened himself to a shepherd. He said that he was the good shepherd. He says, now the hirelings, that's all they've had up to this point. People who are paid to look after the sheep, and they don't love them, and they don't care for them. And when the wolf comes, they run away. But not me. When danger comes, I'll be there, and I'll protect them. And I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. And when I speak to them, they hear my voice, and they follow me. And I call them by name. Maybe this morning, you're hearing the good shepherd calling to you. Maybe you're one of his sheep. Maybe you are willing now, in the privacy of your own life and thoughts, in your own head even, to say, yes, Jesus, I need you. I hear your voice, and I was so lost, I didn't know where to turn. I'm glad you came and found me. I want to be yours forever now. The 23rd Psalm, I think, is perhaps the most, um, is the best-known psalm for just about everybody, even those who don't care a whole lot about the Bible in childhood will learn the 23rd Psalm. And I hope the 23rd Psalm can be something you can say from the heart now this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, and I'll have no want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving wandering sheep like us. Thank you for coming to find us when we get ourselves into trouble and don't know our way back. Thank you for not scolding us, but just picking us up in those arms of love and bringing us home. We rejoice with you that we have been found. And we confess that you are such a good shepherd that indeed we shall never know want the rest of our lives.
Thank you for restoring our souls. Restore them day by day. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.